David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He turned to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me up from a desolate pit out of the muddy clay and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what David is going through and how all these years later it reflects upon us and how it speaks to us. We pray, God, that you take your word and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to say this. When Palm, Palm Sunday, when um, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday comes floating around, I reserve the right to preach this text again, okay? Not the sermon, but the text. thought you were taking a shot at me. I didn't know what you were doing over there. Um, there's all kinds of stuff happening in the background. We're trying to get things straightened out. A uh, lightning storm, thunderstorm messes up everything, so we try to keep it straight. All right, so this is a great verse for Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, but I'm not going to go there with it here, but you'll hear it again eventually. Now, what we got going on is David is in an emotional pit, not a literal pit, and this guy is like learning in the midst of it to be patient. One of the things about verse 1, in verse 1, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He turned to me and heard my cry for help. Okay, this is why you do word, this is why you do the language studies. This is why you, you spend the time, or why I do, spend the time in the original languages to try to understand. Because if you're just reading this in English and looking at it the way it looks in English, you can read it like I just read it. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me, heard my cry for help. No, this, the verb form is intensity in the Hebrew. So when you see this, there is an intensity where David is saying, I waited patiently for the Lord. He, he turned to me. He heard my cry for help. So David is being so intense in this, and you can't just get it. Have you ever sent somebody a text, and you try to be funny or sarcasm or something, and it doesn't go over in a text because it's the text? Yeah. I have learned that if you put one of those winky smiley faces... You can say anything you want to say in a text, and everybody accepts it. You can be mean. You can you do anything as long as you got that winky little smiley face right there. But if you just, and, I, and I've been guilty of it, I've put a joke in, and uh, like when I first met, y'all don't tell her, Miss Angela, my, my, my secretary, my, my ministry assistant, assistant, she sent me a text about something, so I sent a joking text back, and she said, I'm just trying to form you and help you with this. I'm not trying to insult you. And I was like, no, 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 well, it was a joke, it was a joke, winky face, winky face, you know, it was, so we've had to, so I, I've learned when you just see the text, and that's your Bible, you know, it's the text form, and so you see this stuff, and you don't get the intensity that's being brought out by the writer, by the author, for uh, conveyed to us, because we're looking at it the way we are, so there is an intensity going on, this, what is the intensity? This is a man who has been through some severe trials. This man, has he describes it as being in a pit, being in trouble. He's cried out for help. And while he's in that pit and while he feels like there's no hope, and the idea is he can't get out. It is a slimy cistern. He can't climb his way out. He, there's nowhere for him to put his foot. All right, And so... The beauty of what we have in this is that our Jesus, you know, if you, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your Lord and Savior has shown the example of having patience under pressure unlike anybody else. A lot of times we'll say, boy, old Job. But Job just went through it. Look at Job going through it. Job ain't got nothing on Jesus. Jesus was there in the garden. His sweat became like drops of blood. He's in anguish for what's about to happen, how he's going to have to lay down his life for you, for me. But that wasn't the intensity that's really going on. Is that he who knew no sin is about to have all the sins of the world heaped upon him. And so, yeah, if, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But it wasn't. So Jesus went through with it, and he knew that. He knew he had to. So when, when I 
when I'm in the pit, when you're in the pit, the greatest thing you can do when you're in that slimy cistern of a pit that you can't climb out of, that you find yourself in, you got to understand that the Jesus that loves you has been in that same situation. And He showed great patience and example through that. And there's lessons to be gained from it. So we look at verses 1 and 2 again. I just read 1. Let's look at 2. He brought me up from a desolate pit, out of the muddy clay. This is where we're getting into the, the, the sliminess of it all. But what did God do? All right, out of the muddy clay, He set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. So this is the imagery that He's painting for you. He has tried, He has tried in His own strength, in His own power, He has tried to climb up out of that hole, out of that pit. He can't get out. Wherever he puts his foot, it slides back. He can't, there's no sure footing for David to get his feet on to get out. We're talking about a man who was a warrior, a man who was an athlete. a man. That, so when he's talking about, I physically can't do this, there wasn't a whole lot he couldn't physically do. So here he is, I can't get out of this. And that's what we do. We end up in this pit. We end up in this way and we find ourselves trying to climb out of it that we're in ourselves. But there's no power within us to get out of the situation we're in. Now, a couple things going on here for you and me. Sometimes you're in the pit and I'm in the pit because we put ourselves in the pit. Let's just be real. Sometimes it's our fault. We dug the hole. <laughs> And the rains came, and we found ourselves in this slimy cistern of a pit, and we can't get out. Um, I knew two sisters. They, were, they had gotten up into their 80s, and uh, they, were, they, they were in our congregation, and they were in the front yard of their house. True story. And one of them fell in the ditch in the front yard. So the other one said, I'll help you. And she went to pull her up. Now, y'all know it's easier to pull somebody down than to pull somebody up. You know, there's a lesson in that, too. So she pulls her sister into the pit with her. All day, those two ladies sat in that ditch out there and could not get out of that ditch. And they said, people rode by, and we'd go, help, help, and they'd just ride on by and everything. Finally, somebody found them out in the yard, and they were all making jokes how they were out there mud wrestling in the pit. But... Uh, they, they, they spent that day out in there, and they didn't have, because of age, they didn't have the ability, the strength uh, to climb up out of that. And so what you're saying here and you're looking at, sometimes, yeah, we put ourselves in a pit, but there's also instances in life where other people have put you there. It has been beyond your control. It could be a spouse that's not doing what they're supposed to do. It could be a friend. It could be somebody you thought you trusted. It could be a fellow believer. It could be anybody. The beauty, though, is it's not about who put you in the pit, whether it's you or somebody else. That's not the point. God still can pull you out of the pit. And sometimes, you know, the old devil starts whispering in your ear and say, well, you put yourself in this pit, get yourself out. But God didn't say that, okay? We got situations David put himself into plenty of Oh, musty, um, slimy old cisterns. But here we have a situation where it can go either way. Now, Jeremiah, if I'm talking about a cistern and being thrown into a cistern, that ought to bring Jeremiah to your mind if you've been in any Bible study. Jeremiah, they lower Jeremiah by ropes into a cistern. It's in Jeremiah 38. And um, there was no water in it, only mud. It sank down into the mud. A cistern is... Um, Back in the Bible days, it was shaped like a bottle, okay? And uh, they were shaped like they would dig it out of rock. And it'd be solid rock. They'd dig out, shaped like a bottle, and there'd be a small opening here. And the opening here was about two foot, and the opening at the bottom would be about 20 feet. And it would gather and collect the water. And then, you know, in times of drought, when you couldn't have, get water or whatever, you went to the cisterns like a well, and you would draw it out. But this one was dry, no water in it, but the mud. You know how nasty that had to be. And that's what they put Jeremiah in. And um, in Luke 19.10, Jesus says that he came to seek and to save the lost. And Jesus is talking about imagery from Isaiah here about restoration. What David is talking about being pulled out of that pit 
is about being restored by God. Okay? So in his situation, if he needs restoration, what we got going on is a man who put himself there, a man that sinned, a man that did some bad things, and God is restoring him and bringing him out of that. Now, we see in the Bible, in Luke chapter 15, verse 4, Jesus is uh, the divine uh, recovery of those who are lost is brought out there, and he's talking about the lost sheep. So in 15.4 of Luke. So we have example after example of God going after the one that's in trouble, either to save them or restore them. And we can all praise God for that because we've all been there. Either we've gotten away from God and God has taken us and brought us to a place of restoration with Him or we're working towards it. Or when you were lost, and I hope everybody in here is saved, because if everybody in here is saved, that means everybody in here was lost. If I can get you lost, because we can get you saved. So here we go. we got lost individuals coming to the Lord. So we've got the kind of Lord. Our God, our Father, is looking and calling sinners to come back to Him, sinners to be saved, sinners to be restored at the right time. So God takes, according to verse 2... I don't, yeah, there it is. Hey, go ahead of me. All right, according to verse 2, we've got where he takes their feet and sets his feet on a rock, making my steps secure. I don't know how long he was in the pit, but for him it must have felt like eternity. Do you know, you know how good it feels when you finally got your feet on a secure foundation? You, if you've ever gotten yourself in financial trouble and you, you find yourself having to climb out of that financially and then you finally start to get a head on the bills and a head in life and you kind of feel that firm place to put your feet. Maybe your marriage was in trouble and it was rocky and things weren't going well and then you finally climb up and you get to a place where your marriage seems to be on a firm foundation. You, your kids start going sideways on you and things start, aren't going right and then after you, you feel like, man, we're just digging around in this muddy pit. We're never going to get out of this. We're never going to get through this and then along the way, God takes you and places you and puts your feet on that solid foundation and your child is where they need to be. These are are things that God does for us, but it can feel like you are in that pit for way longer than you ever wanted to be. But God comes along, and He does this for us. But what else does He do? He takes us out of the muddy, slippery pit, puts us on a solid rock. He takes us from the slippery, unstable, and puts it, uh, us on the solid, stable takes us from the unsecureness and gives us security. And that's something we all stand in need of. Um, every one of us, every one of us have something in us that we're weak in that area where we want to feel secure in something. Financial security, uh, emotional security, something. We want to feel secure. And one way to wreck somebody is to make them feel insecure about where they are, who they are, and where they stand. But God wants to secure an individual. But then we see that uh, when we've been saved out of our pit, God gives us a song. It takes a special person to have a song in their heart in the pit. And I don't know about y'all, but like in our, in our life, Adria's the singer, not me. But at home, I walk around singing. Can't make her sing. She won't sing for and Isaiah, of course, sings all over the place. He finally just had to say, please stop. But um, he's got a song in his heart. But for me, when I'm in those situations, I'm in a slimy old pit, I don't have a song. And that's how she usually knows something's wrong because I don't have a song. What did God do? Let's look at verse 2 and 3 again. Verse 2, He brought me up out of the desolate pit, out of the muddy clay, set my feet on the rock, making my steps secure. Verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And then we'll talk about the next part in a minute. So here we have a change. When God takes you, gives you that secure foundation, that solid footing, he's going to change your outlook about life. And when he changes your outlook about it, he's changing your frame of mind. And when your frame of mind, David is a musician. 
David is a poet. He's a warrior. He's a poet. He's a musician. This man is, there's a lot to this guy. And um, he's artisan. He's, he's everything. But so here's this man who music, I mean, he wrote the book of Psalms. I mean, he, the man was an amazing musician, and he lost his song. And so here he is. God puts a new song in his heart. And that's part of the praise that becomes into, comes into us, and it changes uh, your tune. And we go from the grappin' and the grumbling and the mumbling and the whining into the praising and the glorifying and the lifting up. And, and other people are supposed to see that in us. Like the rest of the text says, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So many people are going to know you've been down in that pit, saw you down in that pit, but now they see you and you've got a new mindset, you've got a new way of life about you, and you've got a new song in your heart. And that's going to testify of what your Lord and what He did for you. It's praise for the answer of prayer you got. When God answers, if, you, if you're in a pit... Folks, and you're praying to Almighty God, and God answers you, you better give some praise back for that. Don't sit on that information, you know, because God might feel like, well, you don't appreciate what I did for you. Show your appreciation. Uh, praise for being lifted up out of that horrible pit. Praise for coming out of the miry clay. Praise for being put on that solid rock. But when we're sinking down and God comes seeking us and trying to help us, and when we find ourselves saved and the song is back in our heart, that's when people start paying attention and start praying and start seeking you. If There's a lot of teaching today that nothing bad ever happens to you if you have enough faith. And that's a lie. You can have all the faith in the world and still have issues. And, and bad things happening to people is not an issue necessarily of faith. I mean, it can be a factor, but what we have going on here, if nothing bad ever happened to you and you were always praising God, other people would look at you and go, well, yeah, your life is so great. Yeah, I, I imagine I would too. No, when they look at you and they know you went through divorce, when they look at you and know you... You lost a child. When they look at you and know you had cancer or have cancer, when they look at you and see that, that will make an impact on somebody for the glory of God when the praise begins to turn into that. And, and I've shared this over and over. One of the things that drew me to God, what, what the Holy Spirit was working, of course, but God used a friend that was in a car accident that broke his neck, and he had um, joy. And we were both 18, and we, I'd known him since I was seven years old. And I thought, his life's over. And, you know, and I'm with him at the hospital, but he's got joy. I was with him when we, six months later when he got out of the hospital, and he's at home with his little sip and puff chair, but he's got joy. And that's when I started thinking this God thing might be real. Because how can he have joy? Because I asked him, I said, why are you not just depressed and to the point of ending your life? Why, what is this that, that you have? He said, I got saved. Of course, I didn't know what that meant. You know, it took me a while. It, took, it was like two or three years later before I came to salvation myself. But that was a journey that I noticed that in the middle of his suffering, he had joy. So the praise shows lost people that are looking for something that there is something. So those pits, those miry plays that create miry clays that we find ourselves in, and when we're lifted up out of those, God gives us a song, and then our mission, because we are missionaries, is to be able to share that new song with the world. Not to bottle it up, not to hide it under a bushel, no, you know, we're to let our light shine and be able to tell our story to people. So One of the beautiful things about the pit you find yourself in is that you can use that to help somebody else. That's, that's one of the most beautiful things about it. Does it make you feel good about it? Not necessarily. Does it make you go, I'm so glad that happened. I doubt you, I, we say that. You know, I wouldn't say that. But since I did go through it, since you did face it, since you did suffer it, use it for the glory of God. Father, 
We pray, Lord, that there, we know there are people out there that need to see in us that you have worked, you have done great things, and we need to give you glory for it. We pray, God, tonight that we find our song. And, Lord, I want to pray for somebody that might be in an emotional pit right now, and they may be in that situation. I pray, Lord, that you hear their prayers. I pray that they have been calling out to you if they hadn't gotten to that point. May we call out on their behalf. Lord, I pray that you hear them and you pull them from that miry clay. You put their feet on a solid foundation and that they will sing your praise to whoever will listen. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Y'all might have it. 